Speaking of liberty, the National Broadcasting Company takes pleasure in presenting another in the second series of programs under the auspices of the Council for Democracy. Once again, we have a period of free talk on the air, and once again, our host is Rex Stout, who most of you already know as the author of baffling mystery stories featuring the sinuous solutions of that amazing criminologist extraordinary, Nero Wolfe. Well, on these programs, you will get to know Rex Stout even better as an outspoken champion of our American democracy. We present Mr. Stout. Thank you, George Putnam. Good evening, friends of liberty. In this 41st year of the 20th century, when the airplane and radio are turning us all into citizens of the world, it's a pleasure to have as our guest on this program a woman who, instead of deploring that designation, welcomes it and also has earned it. Pearl Buck has lived in China and Japan and has traveled widely in India and Indochina, Russia and Europe, and now lives in America. She has lived under tyranny and under democracy. Democracies have honored her with the Pulitzer Prize in 1931 for her novel of Chinese life, The Good Earth, and with the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1938. Her most recent book is Of Men and Women. Her new novel, Dragon Seed, will be published in January. This world you're a citizen of, Miss Buck, what do you think of it? I think it needs attention, Mr. Stout. Not an exaggeration, I'd say. How do you look at it? With despair, hope, reproach? I look at it with the attitude which I learned from the Chinese in my years in China where I grew up. I don't think this age in which we live is unique or even particularly new. The struggle in which we are all concerned today in one way or another, and whether we know it or not, is a struggle as old as human history between people determined to be free and people determined to rule. The conflict is sharpened because for the moment science has lent its, lent its aid to the ones who want to rule. But the essential war is the same. You say it's as old as history, Miss Buck. Is it also as long as the future? Is it eternal? Will it never end? I'm no perfectionist, Mr. Stout. I don't believe that there is an end to anything that we can call absolute end, especially for democracy. It is easier for tyranny to be absolute than democracy because tyranny is simple and static. But nobody knows yet what complete democracy is because in democracy there is room for unending growth and improvement. When most of the people in the world choose democracy, we shall still not have perfect democracy. For democracy is bounded by the strength and the weakness of human beings. But at least democracy gives people freedom to progress. In tyranny, there is no such freedom. And you prefer democracy. We Americans have always preferred democracy. We prefer it because we have an instinct about it, a very simple instinct, which perhaps is nothing more than a desire to manage ourselves. That is why our ancestors came here in the first place. And kept on coming for 300 years, with their jaws set and their eyes shining to the land of the free. Yes, but where freedom comes from, and how to get freedom, and how to keep freedom, are things we know very little about. We use the word democracy glibly enough, and in every mind, it stands for something approximately the same. But the actual sources of freedom, we do not know. What do you mean by that, Miss Buck? Wasn't it source of the minds and hearts of those who first dreamed of it? What I mean, Mrs. Stout, is that too often we recognize freedom too late, and in the negative. We suddenly know when it is denied us, and then we fight. But we never seem to realize how or when it slips away from us. We live our lives as usual, and then suddenly we find that somewhere in the world, or even among ourselves, tyranny is in the place of power again. How did it happen? Where did it come from? How is it that we didn't know? But here it is, and here are misery and the driving necessity for action, and no time for thinking or observing because we have to react in direct and primitive ways for sheer self-preservation. And when the crisis is over, we forget again. Provided we survive the crisis, that's the immediate problem. Presenting, as you say, the driving necessity for action. That's an essential to preserve freedom, but I wouldn't call it a source. What do you say the sources are? The war between democracy and tyranny is never ended and never can hope to be ended until the sources of freedom are firmly established. I want to say that again before I go into any explanation. 
As to what these sources are, I shall speak today of only one. But it is one of the most primary of all. It is equality between the races. That is, until we see the end of race prejudice, we shall not have democracy triumphant in the world. Well, we certainly won't see the end of race prejudice as long as there are any Nazis left or fellow travelers. That's their ABC. Yes. They've given us a perfect demonstration of the value to tyranny of race prejudice. In the tyranny of Nazism, one of the easiest ways to divide human beings into their ruler and subject peoples is to use race as a basis of the discrimination. It has always been a tenet of Nazism that the colored races must be the subject races. This is because the relationship of the races must either be the democratic relationship of freedom for people to work out the way to live together, or the totalitarian relationship of tyrant and subject peoples. Race prejudice is the way of the tyrant. But the Nazis pretend it isn't prejudice. They try to justify their race theories with anthropological poppycock. Of course, Mr. Stout, but prejudice is latent everywhere. As believers in the democratic system, we hate tyranny and all its attributes. But the fight for freedom can't be won until we recognize the fact that democracy, in its true meaning, involves not only lip service to the doctrine that all men are created equal, but a genuine change in our own attitude toward the colored American. That can be our peculiar contribution to the solution of a world problem. And not only colored Americans, but a lot of other Americans. There are too many words in the American vocabulary which designate this or that fellow citizen as, quote, not like me, unquote. And you can't abolish them by passing a law. Hardly. One of the great differences between democracy as a way of living and tyranny as a way of living is that in a democracy, legislation follows the thought and action of the many, whereas under tyranny it precedes them, for example... If tyranny should, by some mad, opposite, unimaginable whim, decide to end race prejudice in the world, the tyrants could simply say, there must be no more race prejudice, and if there is any after midnight tonight, those who offend will be shot at dawn. And race prejudice, in its outer aspects at least, would disappear forthwith. Unimaginable is putting it mildly. But tyranny changes only the outer aspects. You can't change people's thoughts by passing a law. Democracy doesn't even try to work that way. Under the democratic system, if legislation is to be effective at all, it must follow the thoughts and wishes of a majority of the people. Otherwise, it just isn't obeyed. The laws in our country aren't fixed. They're passed. And if enough people disobey them, they are repealed. Even the noblest of experiments. Yes. Only when enough people obey them, because enough people believe them right, do they finally become laws in the true sense. Look around you anywhere for the practical proof. Law enforcement depends not only on the police, but on the consent and belief of the people. For example, right here in New York State, it is the law that colored Americans shall have the right to enter any host hotel or restaurant that white Americans do. In other words, in public places, there shall be no discrimination on the ground of race. But the law is not obeyed because not enough people want to obey it. But colored Americans have the right to bring suit for damages. And they have that right, and sometimes they have sued, but seldom because they realize that from a practical point of view, the legislation is not yet really a law. It isn't actually a working law unless enough people want it to be so. Well, then it is, in fact, however cruel and unjust, a democratic process. I don't know about that. If the result is not democratic, the actions that result from these feelings are anything but democratic, and that is very important if we Americans really want democracy in the world. The test of an individual's true democracy is in his thinking and in the daily actions which flow out of that thinking. In a totalitarian state, it may not matter much what anybody thinks or feels because he does what he's told. Laws come down from above. But the opposite is true in a democracy. Laws do not come down from above. They come out of the wishes of the people and depend on the people for their fulfillment, and they become effective law only when they are the wishes of many people. There is this obvious and simple relation of thought, feeling, and action in a democracy. Well, what do you think we can do about this problem of prejudice, Miss Buck? First, we must recognize it for what it is. We must realize that when prejudice against some people exists because of their skins or because of their creeds, it cuts at the very tap root of democracy, which offers equal opportunity to every individual. That's the glory of democracy. 
and we weaken our own cause when we refuse to face these prejudices in ourselves which deny it. But recognizing will not abolish them. A state of mind can often be changed, but a prejudice isn't even a state of mind. It's a state of feeling and usually goes to the bone. Anything can be changed in a democracy, for it is only necessary that enough people decide to change the situation when they perceive it. And my experience with our people is that ignorance and not unwillingness to change is at the root of race prejudice. Many a white American working ardently and with patriotism for the cause of democracy in the world and the overthrow of tyranny abroad undoes his own work by his attitude toward colored Americans, by his actions toward them, by his continued ignorance of the share which 13 million Americans of one race alone have in our democracy. Many a white American would change his attitude toward colored Americans if he understood this contradiction. There are 13 million colored Americans today who are being told to fight for liberty and equality. Who could blame them if they asked whose liberty, what equality? Well, if they don't, it's because they realize that with all its imperfections, democracy is the only system under which it is possible for them to get anywhere at all. I believe that's true, and yet that does not excuse white Americans for continuing an attitude which produces direct action against democracy in the world as a whole. For our colored Americans are not alone, Mr. South. There are the millions of India and China, the millions of India who, without being given the right to choose for themselves, have been forced to support a democratic government which has not given them democracy. The millions of China, the peasants and the little farmers, oppressed for years by their own warlords and by their own rich and even by the educated of their own race. But, Miss Buck, we've been told that China is the oldest of the democracies. So it is, and so is England a democracy, and so is America. But for whose liberty and equality are we fighting unless we fight for all? Unless we are willing to face this full front of battle at home, we shall lose, even though Hitler himself is defeated. And we cannot evade by refusal to speak to each other of our weaknesses. The American must not fear to speak of India to the Briton, nor refuse to acknowledge the Negro. And neither he nor the Briton must fear to speak with Canada to China about her own Chinese. Do you mean now, Miss Buck, while China's fighting for her life? While even Gandhi avows the prior necessity of destroying the Nazis? If the house is on fire, hadn't we better put the fire out before we start repairing the furniture? I don't think so, Mr. Stout. Democracy can't win while these contradictions remain unchanged. We shall lose from within. For this war is more than a material war. It is a war which, if the democracies are to win, they must win by clear conviction. We won't get an all-out effort, even for defense, unless the moral issue is made clear for all honest people. They will make ready their full defense. They will fight wholeheartedly only for that in which they deeply believe. But they must first make sure that the thing in which they believe is true and not a mouthful of words. This is what I deeply believe myself. Millions upon millions of people at this hour, now approaching crisis, wait for leadership toward freedom. That leadership will not come in clear and infallible and necessary strength until it first comes out of moral truth. Millions ready to follow wait for a sign. What better sign could there be than that the enslaved within the democracies themselves shall be freed? Nothing and no one could prevent victory then. Well, I am for victory. Thank you, Miss Buck. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest this afternoon has been Pearl Buck, whose new novel, Dragon Seed, will be published in January. This is Rex Stout saying goodbye until next week. You have just heard the fifth of another series of programs entitled Speaking of Liberty, brought to you each week by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with the Council for Democracy, a national organization dedicated to the propagation of an American faith in democracy. Next week, Rex Stout will bring to the microphone Frank Javasi, Foreign correspondent just returned from a 36,000-mile trip about the world. A copy of the script of this broadcast will be mailed free to anyone requesting it. Address your letter or card to the Council for Democracy, 285 Madison Avenue, New York City. Speaking of Liberty has reached you through the red network of the National Broadcasting Company.